Here it is. Yay. We're still Yay. Hi. <laughs> We're back. Sorry about that. We kind of cut out momentarily. But welcome back to our discussion. Um, give me one second here and I'm going to share screens. Yay. Welcome everyone to Paris Gibson Square Museum of Arts virtual artist discussion with Maggie Rosicki Hiltner. Um, I wanna welcome you and I want you also to feel free to leave comments below. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Maggie just so you know a little bit about her. Really we'll learn more about her as we go along as she talks about herself and the work that she brings to us. Um, I have a little bit to read about Maggie Hiltner. Um, Maggie Rosicki Hiltner is a full-time studio artist and activist who moved to Red Lodge, Montana with her family in 2005 to establish the Red Lodge Clay Center. She grew up in Pennsylvania and comes from a family of makers. And she earned her BFA in sculpture with a concentration in fibers from Syracuse University and was a studio assistant at Aromont School of Arts and Crafts. She was a 2015 recipient of the Montana Arts Council Artists Innovation Award and she searches and searches for innovative ideas through her uh, craft, uh, what would you call it, Maggie? craft digging yes. in, in thrift shops to create um, wonderful contemporary works of art that interrogate the history of craft and meld it with contemporary life of women and families and people overall. So welcome, Maggie. Thank you. Hi, Nicole. Hi. <laughs> And I am Nicole. I am the curator of collections and exhibitions here at Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art. So thank you all for coming. I want to also thank um, all the people who support the institution and the exhibitions that are shown at Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art. Without your generous support, your championing of the institution and the artists that show here, including all the staff that work hard to bring you all interesting educational information about the arts so that we grow fuller minds. I appreciate you all and everyone here is grateful for your support of education and the arts in Montana and specifically here in Great Falls, Montana. So thank you so much. Maggie Hiltner is here speaking about her work which is included in the exhibition Beyond Intention it's an exhibition that includes the work of Jennifer Reif Snyder and Ashley Blaylock as well. So this exhibition is truly concentrating on contemporary fiber arts and mixed media. The exhibition um, aims to address the topic of intention as it relates to the profound relationship between the traditions of fiber arts in women's lives as well as its power in the making or breaking of identity, social roles and societal constructs. The exhibition is comprised of three distinct presentations of work by each artist that inquire into the meaning of intention as it pertains to them individually. Materials, process and narrative form part of the visual conversation as they repurpose, reuse and redirect meaning in a multi-dimensional way. Works shown utilize established techniques like crochet, needlepoint, quilting, knot tying, pattern making, but reimagine their purpose and use by transforming them into artworks that go beyond original intention. So thank you, Maggie, for being part of this um, amazing exhibition with amazing artists and for taking the time to give of yourself through this conversation. You're very welcome. <laughs> so we're just gonna 
loosely take a quick look at um, the installation of Maggie's work here at Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art. Her work is exhibited in the Roth Schiller Gallery. As you can see here, this exhibit of work within the larger exhibit is titled Cast of Characters. Um, Maggie, want to tell us a little bit about that title? Sure. Um, so this exhibition is a few years in the making. And when we started talking about what work might come, I was looking at kind of some major pieces that were still around and available and realizing that I use, used over time different characters to express different things. So I kind of dug around and talked about that with you and wrote about that with you about how I used either storybook characters or these comic book characters or mad moms and a couple other skeletons and that sort of thing to tell my stories. And that's where, it, that's how we put this together. So. And really when I, when I was talking to Maggie is that what's really interesting about her cast of characters and the arrangement of the work it, it really connects to people as it shows the stages of lives, the stages of life for, for humans, right? Mm -hmm. What we go through in life from the beginning until the end. And we'll see more of that as we discuss with Maggie here. Here's another perspective of the exhibition. And through the door, you can kind of see um, how that connects with Ashley's piece. You can see her work in the Thayer Gallery. So to begin with, I think a good start, a good way to get started, uh, Maggie, is to um, look at these familiar faces pieces. Um, tell us a little bit about where these came from and, and sure. what's going on. Sure. So for this body of work, the familiar faces I made, usually before this, before 2009, um, I used a lot of Dick and Jane style storybook characters to tell my stories. And then I had some stories I wanted to tell. These stories are semi-autobiographical, but I had some pretty autobiographical ones. And I realized that Dick and Jane, they weren't necessarily appropriate for Dick and Jane to act, act out. You know, I like to wink, wink, nudge, nudge, but not always hit things straight on the nose. So I made these avatars. I collaborated with my young child. I said, hey, you know, draw me a cat to, to a six-year-old. And, and she would draw it and then I would animate them. I look at a lot of comic books. They're are one of my influences. And so like on the left, I'm telling a story about my brother and I that's quite violent. Um, and it would, it would read differently. Um, we all know cartoon violence with, you know, Tom and Jerry and animals is a little different than when you see humans doing that same violence and the one on the right is a little romantic and so I needed some avatars to take care of to take care of that for me so I you know I'm always appear in these I'm the I am the character of the bird on the right uh, in the on the bike and then I'm the bunny on the left <laughs> um, it's kind of interesting when people find themselves people from my life find themselves in one of these oh am I the monkey yes you're the monkey but and I, I use a lot of found embroidery. And then sometimes I draw out, my mom is, uh, loves doing kits. So I'll make a kit for my mom and send it to her so I can incorporate her stitches into my work too. So for the sibling rivalry one, I sent her some, you know, bunnies and cats to stitch. And then she came back with, was, is this true? You know, did your brother really fight like this? And yeah, <laughs> yeah it's true. So Tell us a little bit about, um, you mentioned like kits, like mm -hmm. what is, tell us for those people who are not familiar with this kind of work, can you explain a little bit about what that means and, and what kind of work this is? Sure. So before I embroider, I work out all of what I want it to work like on paper. I do a drawing and work it out. And then I will put that drawing on a light box and put a piece of cotton over it and draw it, transfer it to the cloth. After that, it gets embroidered in with the stitches. So, you know, there's color choices and how you want it to look. And sometimes I stitch very neatly. Um, when you'll see that in some later work. And sometimes I do it sort of this messy style that blends in with more funky folk embroidery that I find. So, 
if I make a kit for someone, I'd send them all the colors and everything drawn out and they just go ahead. That's very common to use Aunt Martha tea towel patterns or something you'd buy in the store. And it's sort of like a paint by number or a coloring kit. So I, I collect gobs and gobs of that stuff. And then I make what I don't find, I make myself. Well, so you're kind mom. of um, building on this um, tradition of these little commercial kits in a way, right? Absolutely. That were made accessible to crafters. Yep. So that they could, um, you know, utilize a preset pattern or something and build a story. But what's interesting that is that you're making this preset pattern for your mom, mm -hmm. right? Based on ideas that you've developed from your own life. <laughs> Does she ever realize what's happening? In yeah, she, she has. And she loves, I mean, it's one of my favorite things is getting my mom's embroidery into a museum. It's, it's great. And you know, she sews all the time too, but she just, she doesn't want to make her own thing. She enjoys doing, doing kits, big needle points and cross stitch kits. So occasionally I can get her to work for me. <laughs> so tell me, tell us a little more about what, what's going on here about this idea of the, the bittersweet in a way. Sure. Oh, well, I'm, we'll talk about cul-de-sac cul-de-sac vengeance. Uh, growing up, I lived in, um, when I was an adolescent, a lot of these, you know, I, I think, I think making art is a little bit of self-soothing. It's a little therapeutic, can work out things that you're a little sweaty about and make art about it, talk about it. And then you're not quite so sweaty about it anymore. And it's always fascinating to me to relate to other people through it. So um, in my adolescence, I lived near a develop in, near Worsford, Pennsylvania, near development, Providence Forge. And I hung out with a lot of boys there you know, and played video games. You'll see my little bike person playing Nintendo and skateboarding and occasionally making out with these boys, you know, it's middle school type thing. So this um, is you. So where, where are we seeing that? Are we seeing this over here? Yeah. So the first house at the top is me playing in Nintendo with a lion and a bear. And then I kind of do some, I, it's the same character repeated, you know, through, through the scenes um, and just interacting with the different people in the neighborhood at different times. But in the real story, one of the traumatic things of my middle school experience, I left my bike over at a boy's house and in the heat of the summer and a bad adolescent idea these boys decided they were going to bash up my bike with a baseball bat I oh, didn't know no. yeah in effigy I was getting destroyed because you know I somebody was mad at me for some bad decision I made so, so it really oh. was vengeance yeah it was vengeance so but my bike had the vengeance because in this bad decision one of the boys hit the tire with the baseball bat and the bat bounced up and hit another boy in the face and, you know, cracked his head open and there was ambulances. It got very dramatic. And so um, that's what's happening down here. That's what's happening there. And then eventually I come rolling up and the poor smash bike has been dragged in the woods and the kids are all crying. It was a very dramatic afternoon. So, um, Hey, you, you know, well, I might have, felt feelings of shame and embarrassment I you know you work it out and it's just part of the story you know it's just, just one of those things that happened so I feel like it's interesting because you were talking about the influence of comics mm -hmm. and Dick and Jane and oftentimes some comic books and or stories and Dick and Jane definitely are kind of teaching you how to be yeah you know like what's right and what is not right or like you see the thing that's wrong and at the end it's like that was wrong <laughs> you know and do you feel like you add some of that kind of moralizing tale or whatnot to your to your work you know a little bit but in the end nobody's really happy at the end nobody wins you know everybody's kind of left with a oh <laughs> like, you'll see that again and again it's not right or wrong or up and down it's just it just happens, you know, that's life. And it just is what, which I think is great in terms of that contrast, right? Mm -hmm. Cause like Dick and Jane was very much like, this is it. Yeah. Right? Idealized. And that's, mm -hmm. I look all those, I look at a ton of uh, old school books and primers and magazines and all that idealized stuff. I, it just, it stinks. It, it does. I have a whiff of it's untrue. You know, we all know life is much more complex than that. It can still be very beautiful and colorful and fun, but it's also quite icky. A lot. <laughs> so. 
I like how you are utilizing that idea of the comic book in your organization of space with the work as well and the flatness too. Mm. We see this kind of idea of, you know, there's a little bit of hierarchy in terms of your role as being the center character here, correct? Right, right. And, and so all of these kind of visual um, techniques to still get the message across without using, you know, you know, the characteristic of, of you know, uh, perspective in the traditional way, right? Right. Everything kind of happens all at once. And then you look around and find your way. It's a map. You know, this one definitely has a map quality. But would you say that in terms of the history of quilting and embroidery, that this type of perspective is often utilized, correct? Yeah, I definitely think so. I think you see that everything all at once in a, in a pictorial quilts and that sort of in, in pictorial embroidery, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's a reference to that. <laughs> and then eventually those, I mean, here's some comics that I love. Nancy was pretty good for um, pointing out that not everything's always good all the time. And some of those Dick and Jane style characters. So I collect a lot of this imagery and might start from there and alter them and get them to hold what I want and do what I want in, in the later imagery. But um, eventually, then too, I wanted to see when I was a kid, there were a lot of storybooks that looked like they were made out of felt, you know, the pictures and, or even that animation, kind of like the Rudolph animation where everything's mm -hmm, soft. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to see a comic book that was stitched. So I did make oh, comic books of those full panels too, that would help you read it in a more linear way if you want to. Mm -hmm. So would you say that popular culture, like television and storybooks and comic books, that's a big part of how you formulate your vernacular and your, and your narrative in terms of what you create? Yeah, I definitely put it all. Um, we were talking about this earlier. I, I feel like I curate my mind, you know, and I put everything in, but I sort of hold it all in the same reverence. You know, I respect and love art history and classical art just as much as I love the comic book and Mork and Mindy. So if you let it all be on the same plane, some really interesting mashups can happen. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that brings us a little bit to this piece by camp, this piece called Camp, mm -hmm. The Perils and Merits of Touch. Mm -hmm. Here, I think this is a good example of that melding that you were just talking about, like the classical with the popular, mm -hmm. right? And the traditional. I think so. This has a lot going on. There's, there's uh, Polish folk tales and Greek mythology and um, references to cherubs and pooty and it's just that making a larger piece there's room in my mind I'm like well throw it all in there and um, the animals there's a lot of animals in here and they usually uh, guide you to look where I want you to look you know a lot of the issues of the gaze sometimes people are looking out at you sometimes the animal's eyes direct you where to look um, but definitely um, thinking about camp, which, you know, for people think of this as like a healthy nature, you know, you're out in nature doing wholesome things. But when you're an adolescent, camp is mostly interpersonal relationships. It's who likes who and it's very, um, it's, it's a lot more racy than, than just crafts and than in nature. So this one definitely investigates a lot of those issues. <laughs> So what she's saying, like, I mean, it's hard to tell in this image, um, but we have a lot of different little vignettes right here. You can see the little boy who's camping and he's got his little fireplace. But within those, within these kind of levels that she's created here, we have little stories taking place about, about um, growing up, right? Yeah. About and what it means to be in an awkward stage of life and being uncertain about what's going on and it's it's sort of um uh it's about i talk about touch because there's a lot of things set up at camp that will give you opportunities to touch people like first aid classes or reference in here swimming lessons wrestling and there are all these ways that were since you, in, in adolescence you're not really totally comfortable maybe even adulthood about how you're allowed to touch people you're working it out in those through those activities and they they get a little more loaded. 
Um, and then this one has, has sort of that shoots and ladders reference. There's a big ladder in there. That reference is a Polish folk tale um, where a ta there's a village where it rains all the time and um, whoever can get it to stop raining, you know, gets to marry the king's daughter or something. So a tailor comes and collects all the ladders and climbs up and sews up the sky. So in a lot of the larger pieces I make, I put myself hidden in the work somewhere. So, you know, when you go and look at that, there's me at the top of the ladder, actually with a little needle sewing up the sky. And then these birds are swooping down and they're a mix of birds I found and then birds I stitched myself in the style of the find, found ones and they're coming down and approaching a boy and a lot in a, the, the fire recurs as a symbol in here. And so it's a little bit of an Icarus or not an Icarus, the Prometheus reference who mm -hmm. gave fire to humans and then was punished by having his liver eaten every day by a giant eagle, which was one of my favorite paintings in the Philadelphia Museum of Art as a kid. So, you know, just anything goes, you put it all in there and see what comes out. And I think that really speaks to your knowledge of art history, right? And how you are looking, um, you're looking at those elements of tradition and the classics and, and what was seen symbolically in art, right? And how that has influenced you and the work that you're creating here. So let's look at this piece here because you were speaking to me earlier about the importance of that symbolism in your work. Right, so over here, the, these Ruben, this Ruben's painting is perfect example of, um, you either have cherubs or pooty. So usually when it's religious art, we call it cherubs. And if it's secular art, we call it pooty. There's little flying babies that are in a lot of classical art, which are pretty ridiculous and, and fun. And I, when I found those giant embroidered babies, I knew right away that they were going to appear here. <laughs> they're I'll switch it back kind of, so you can they're kind of up in the up in the air and and interacting with that ribbon and you know making this doorway into this world. So this kind of it also has sort of a big arching window reference or something. And then the flowers, I'm a flower arranger. And sometimes I feel a little, you know, flat flowers can are decorative when you find embroidery, you know, you put flowers on your pillowcases and your tablecloths. But flowers have been traditionally in art for all for a long time and they have a lot of symbolism and flowers are definitely part of our daily lives and part of our celebrations and even our mourning and things like that on the on the left this one ties definitely this this end paper I love those end paper maps that you see a lot in children's books um, and because again they break the rules of perspective they mush it all in there to get you to this place so this one definitely references that piece that had the the bird on the bike going through this the paths and the people and the towns and uh, and it breaks the rules you can just all the information that needs to be in there is squished in and the scale isn't quite right that laundry is really enormous if you think about it that's hanging in the background <laughs> but it has to be there <laughs> And I think that it's also, you know, uh, what were we saying earlier about that piece and how, oh, this idea of melding this imaginative somewhere land, mm -hmm. right? Somewhere between what's real and what's not real, right? Right, right. And you how said. important is that to you in your work? Um. You know, it's pretty great to get to make your own worlds. It's a really interesting thing. So, and that's one of the things I say, one of my favorite comic book artists, Linda Barry says, is it autobiography? If parts of it are not true, is it fiction if part of it, parts of it are? So that's like, everything's winking. Some like those babies are holding the ribbon. Well, the ribbon is real, but the world's not real. You know, like there's, there's always that game of, what part did I make? What part did I find? What part is true? What part is embellished? A good storyteller always embellishes the story to make mm -hmm. it more entertaining. So, and, and I don't, I don't worry, or if I, if I know the rules, I want to poke at them a little bit. I am very super flat, you know, I, uh, knowing the rules of perspective makes me want to break them. So, um, you were saying that it's it's super flat, right? You're talking about this perspective and 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 this uh, interconnection between what's true and what's not true, and you you have obviously this heavy understanding of Christian iconography in in basically in your life upbringing. 
-hmm. and in the work that you create, um, how much of that has kind of impacted the way that you create these works that kind of delve into um, disavowing um, certain expectations about the way life is for families or for women or you know like how you should how you should be acting and what's right. going on with your life right and this Peter Paul Rubens is a good example to begin with right yeah that is a very idealized situation there um, <laughs> and so definitely um, looking at I love Catholic imagery and all those symbols and them and iconography and but the ideal like anything that has an ideal or perfection I'm kind of raising an eyebrow to like that's not really how <laughs> how mothers and babies always are you know I guess it's just always a piece of art captures a moment in time but I kind of like the the moments in between when things are going a little hairy <laughs> and that's what you usually see <laughs> right. and it, yeah respect to all the different things I look at and they all kind of come in and come out at the at the same time with the same reverence or irreverence perhaps mm -hmm. <laughs> and that brings us to our mad moms right yeah. yes <laughs> this definitely so when you were talking about you know okay I took there's probably about a 15 year lag or so many years lag okay I dealt with all my ideas about adolescence and young adulthood and sexuality and this and I'm, now I'm getting on to having kids and a family and that pressure and how am I going to kind of process this through my art and then this series came out um and when I was with another mom friend and she was showing me these little drawings her son made where he was teasing her he was probably five at the time drawing the little smiley face and writing mad mom but then you know it's a smile but it had the mean eyebrows and I thought oh this kid's brilliant I'm gonna rip him off so I started drawing <laughs> these these matching mashing those kid, child style drawings with these idealized 1950s ad type bodies um both of these thinking of my own mother and my own adults when and when I was a child and the realistic uh you know stuff that was going on and then at myself as a mom too it's just who the daily grind of uh of of uh homemaking and family making is is something. <laughs> it's something so would you say that your early life like growing up with your family is a big part of the reason as to why you make art and the ideas behind a lot of the work that you make sure it's just all reflecting and yeah absolutely I mean I everybody um in my family was very is very handy they, they're good at making things you know and there's no talking you out of making things and there's no reason you wouldn't make things you know if you want a mural on the wall go ahead and do it but um so I felt very, I always feel very encouraged to do, to make things, to express myself and to work out my ideas, but definitely I'm coming from a place of memory, then adding, you know, looking out, not only, I can only, uh, you know, hold my own row for so long. I have to look out and, and, mm -hmm. and reflect on other things too. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you would also say that this reflection of the, the disgruntled mother, <laughs> is not only a reflection of like, let's say your life experience growing up with your mother, but also of your own lived experiences. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, I, I think I, I can have fun, but my kids will say, mom, don't use the voice, you know, if I get mad at them, but in mostly it's just, you keep it on the sunny side, but um, man, it, it's just the normal part of the day is getting frustrated with, with, life and the, and the mess of the mess of life. <laughs> so tell us about these ones that the images that we're looking at here and how you constructed them and, and what's going on in the scenes. Sure. So usually I'm responding to, I don't use a lot of patterned cloth in my work, but I love it. And I collect a little of it. So some of these are vintage fabrics or they're reproductions of vintage fabrics. And I'm just playing with color and trying to make something that looks really fun from far away and then when you get up close there's a little surprise for you um and there's you know the mashup of, of just the daily grind of getting your groceries and you can imagine and you walk in the door and you know things aren't as you expect them to be so your face is a little harried or that that eternal the yellow one is that 
nonstop puddle that you find on the floor when you have small children where you're sort of wondering what it is and you know clean it up again and there's a lot of dirty dishes and just the whole thing of smiling that there's a thing with parenting where you're trying to keep it on the sunny or I guess life where you're smiling but then your face betrays you a little bit like oh grit it maybe maybe you're gritting your teeth more than smiling <laughs> You know, you smile through the pain, right? Oh, like, here we go again. But not so much in these images, because I don't think the moms here seem to be (laughs) hiding that pain. So I I collect a lot of this imagery. I just absolutely love it because it's ridiculous. You know, their their aprons are so fluffy and so pristine. Um, And, you know, this is the kind of thing where I'll, well, I'll keep this imagery for the bodies and then I'll match it up <laughs> for their, for their, with the faces. <laughs> but I love that kind of like those, the ideas that you're working with, like this inspiration for just as much as the Peter Paul Rubens is an inspiration to you. Um, so are these, you know, these vintage ads of like, you know, woman's life, you know, the strange, you know, interconnections between this like virgin mother who, you know, rises from a giant womb of flowers that bursts open held by Pooty, because, you know, that's how everybody's born, right? <laughs> the flower door rises, you know, opens like a magical curtain. And then you're this, you know, this beautiful mother with this full grown child. And, you know, yeah. and, you know, along with these other elements of yes, okay, well, now you're this mother and what is the expectations of the world around you and how did women come up through this time um, figuring out what exactly they should be doing and how perfect they should be around it. But your mad moms, you know, points out that the truth is not that you can buy any fancy dish that you want to buy. Yeah. Dinner might start real nice but it might end in the mad mom phase you know (laughs) it's like I guess I see these images out in the world or or when I'm in uh thrift stores and I'm digging around and I just sort of questioning the truth and then I that's where the art comes from it's like "Hmm, what was really going on here and it's not it's never all good it's never all bad it's just a little messier (laughs) Mm -hmm. and I think the interesting part is that frustration of wanting that ideal too yeah yeah wanting to reach this ideal that they're showing you in magazines and propaganda and they're like well this is how you should be this is what it is but you're like well how is could that be it's never like that (laughs) no well and even in this show Uh, like I'm saying, oh, I'm the bird. I'm all of these people all the time. I'm still the adolescent having those thoughts. And I'm also this mom having this thoughts and they're, they're all sort of mashed up and they fight with each other. You know, my, my adolescent brain doesn't always like this adulting thing. So, um, (laughs) you know, that I have to work it out with. (laughs) You'd rather be playing Nintendo. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Actually. And reading my comic books. Yes. (laughs) don't we all so this is a piece that's interesting because it it just um, connects with all those pieces do you want to tell us a little bit about this sure so in 2008 I had my youngest child and uh so it's in an art there there's um, a really great video out there that Kate Kretz made a lecture called motherhood the last art taboo so being an artist is not you're not always supposed to bring your kid to the show you know you're supposed to be this cool savvy whatever you know not get too whimsical not get too sentimental it, it's an interesting thing to ponder uh so i do reflect on motherhood and i reflect on everything that happens to me and Sometimes it has to go a little sideways. So again, collecting things, I found this fantastic pink velvet and that I wanted to use in my work, usually use velvet. But at the time I was wrestling with the multiple uses of a female body. You know, I am my child's mother, but I'm also my husband's wife. I am this person and I was just feeling 
very in demand. And so that's maybe how this piece came about. You know, there's that sort of nurturing side, the milk side that you're trying to give to the world. And there's the honey side, which is sort of the sticky, sweet, good stuff that you're trying to deal with too. So there's sort of different la layers of maybe these, um, these characters acting out like whether nourishment, whether they want to investigate the sweetness, the honey, more of a sexuality side. So I come in there and have these, um, these, this landscape of lactation <laughs> and then these modified honey bears and just all the characters deciding what they're going to take and what they're going to leave behind in this. So that's how I work on these ideas as I stitch them out. <laughs> like this little vignette, this little scene into kind of like the idea of the odyssey, right? <laughs> You're trapped in this uh island of delights here choosing between the two is going to be difficult yeah but you can only go one way right one way at a time it doesn't work. really one way at a time you know and that i mean i think as a as a mom that's a really confusing hard time where you're like holding a baby one minute then trying in the next it's very it's very hard it's very difficult to um, to, to reconcile those two, two roles. So. So tell us about these little individuals that you have here. Um, you know, tell us more about how this comes about, how you construct them and sure. Cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of work that goes into these pieces and how you begin and how you start and how you end and just this like history of material as well. Yeah. So I'm finding all that green leafy stuff is all found embroidery that I'm going to collage with. And then um, the black lined figures, those are all stitched and they're stitched with a very tiny back stitch. Um, but they don't, I don't just jump in and stitch a perfect picture. I, I collect, like I'm looking at those Dick and Jane style books and that sort of thing. And um, finding poses that I find evocative and collecting them. And then I alter them and re like trace and retrace until I get them to do just what I want. They're my models. If I can't find a model, sometimes I set my kid up and take a picture and go from there. But you, I find some really cool poses or in the newspaper, I find poses, work out the drawing um, till it's just the way I want. And then I put it on a light table and I trace it onto the cloth with a Pigma pen. And then I stitch over that. So it's pretty tiny. And so a lot of times people think it's a machine or something, but it's just me. And uh, so there, in my work, the black lines are sewing. And then, then with the bigger things like the honey bears, I'll sort of counterfeit found embroidery. So I'll stitch them a little messier because I want them to blend in with the other found stuff. And it all gets put together. And that's the kind of trick to me is to get the, um, like that girl, those girls who are squeezing the honey bears. I love it when I can get a character to interact with the embroidery. And that's that game again with like, that embroidery is real. How are you getting it? Like what part's a picture and what part is actually being acted on? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're still playing with that idea. You're like, in a sense, utilizing that idea of like tricking the mind, right? with the yeah. work that you have not only in the concept and the idea that you're presenting but the materials that you're using and how you juxtapose them as well yeah just playing you know it's it's all a playful little wink like um nothing here is real but when you get into a story everything starts to feel very real and you know you're in it with with these characters I hope yeah and I think that's something that's very um, alluring and attractive about your work is that the longer that the longer you look at the work and you take time to absorb what's happening on all the different levels that you really begin to see the connections um, of how you know artworks come together through your knowledge of material and through your knowledge of art history there's just a many layered, um, you know, thread of information that's going on in your work. It really deserves a lot of time and looking and appreciation. And, and if you really only have a few minutes to look at it, you, you kind of see it off the bat. The remarkable part here in, in the exhibit is to see people look at the work. 
yeah. and um, comment on it and really think about what they're seeing and how they feel. Mm-hmm. So right now, as we're talking with Maggie and she's sharing her interpretation of the work as it comes to her as an artist, when you come to see the work in person, you have a whole other suitcase of information that you bring with you as a viewer. Even right now, as we're talking, you probably have a many things that you're thinking about that come to your mind, which feel free to write in the, in the comment box and Maggie can get back to you too, if you have it with an answer as to whatever's crossing your mind, um, but also being open to your own thoughts. Right, Maggie? That's important to you, isn't it? Oh, that was my, I mean, at the opening, I just love hearing what the stories people tell me, you know, and their memories. Hopefully the work is evocative in a memory way. That's what a lot of these materials uh, bring up memories. They have associations for people. And so then they'll tell me their story about camp or whatever this comes up. And I love that. That's, that's the port. Like I make this work for me and then I'm just tickled if it connects to the world. And then, um, then there's the whole other life it has out there. And, you know, I, if people want to know the story, that's a lot of fun, or they can just find whatever they find in there. It's like getting to know a person, you know, you have that first impression and then the more you talk to them, hopefully they get more and more interesting, the more you get to know them or maybe a little weirder. That's okay too. But it's wonderful. Cause it's like, um, it just, it's like this flowering of ideas, really like the birth of ideas is when, when you see um, people looking at Maggie's work and just um, becoming enveloped by it, like new things are rising to their mind and you know, the associations of things that maybe they've lived has, is like visually depicted before them. And it's such a strange wave to them, but they, <laughs> but they like immediately connect and they're like, wow, that was, that was, that was crazy, but that really works, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so now that I'm thinking about all this, like, you know, you know, coming to being and your discussion about life as a young person and motherhood and birth, Mm -hmm. We make this full circle to this observation about, you know, what comes next, right? Right. And definitely the skeleton is a character that turns up in my work quite a bit now. Um, It's very topical of the times we're living in, but it's also art history topical. There's a long history of the skeleton in art and memento mori. And when I use the skeleton, it's not a sad or a scary thing. I really love talking to kids about it. I mean, we all have a skeleton. We carry it around with us all the time. And um, it's a great universal symbol because it's genderless and, you know, it's, it's kind of just a human. Um, I, these are definitely an art historical reference here. Uh, you know, you when you're thinking about memento mori, it's about appreciating life because you will die. Remember, you will die. So eat the fruit when it's ripe and use your time wisely and don't be tempted by the riches of the world. It's, it's just when I'm exploring ideas about mortality, it's because I'm really appreciating life. So. And it's another way we deal with flowers. Flowers are a huge part of the funerary experience. So, and tell us about these pieces that you have that are here because and and I, and you are and I'm and what I'm asking specifically is because they're they're um, they're different. They're like quilts mm-hmm. as opposed to being framed and and right. mounted on like a piece of fabric. So, do you want to explain the kind of different techniques that you work with? Sure. So up until um, about 2015, I work in a a stitched and layered way, but it's more, I would call embroidery collage. And it, it, by official definition, could be called a quilt, but it doesn't really reference the form of a quilt as much, which most people think of layered and a little puffy and that sort of thing. And, but in 2015, I started working in quilts and with found quilts as well. You know, I'm in the junk store and I'm finding all this embroidery and then I'm finding abandoned quilts and I'm really getting influenced by them. So some of these ideas, I just wanted to explore in the quilt. Um, This series definitely started from finding things like finding a glut of fruit imagery and then just starting to, okay, that's in a pile over there. I'm going to get to that and making sort of these fruit patterns, these mandalas. This one in the middle, I found this embroidered clock face and that really struck me and started rooting around in my mind of 
oh, this maybe the memento mori idea starts coming up. And then on the the last one with the jewelry, that was a piece of gold embroidery edging that I had found that was actual gold, which was a whole other world of embroidered embellishment. So all of this kind of goes in the head and the art history stuff stirs it around and these are what came out. Um, and, you know, the other thing was I love my materials and linen really is evocative of bone to me. The texture of linen really reminds me of bone. And um, so, yeah, I, I tried to see what I could do. I wanted to see bones in linen. I think that, oh no, sorry, I was just thinking about what you were saying, and um, this, I just, it's interesting how deeply the material and just the story of the material really influences the way that you build your concept. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting to me that you started on this idea of memento mori, and that idea, how it connects towards the finding of these like hordes of materials that are discarded, Yes. Um, do you ever, when you're creating for even, you know, Memento Mori or other pieces, is how important is it to you in your work to really think about like the history of the material, the object that's coming into your ownership and how it's transformed? Do you, do you ever ponder the history of that material in terms of who owned it and, and how that would have influenced yeah. it coming into your work? It's, you know, finding this I feel like I'm saving a lot of these textiles. They're they are truly abandoned. They're in, you know, thrift stores for a couple of bucks and they're countless hours of usually women's work just devalued. So I'm trying to save that. And now people know my know what I do. And a lot of people approach me and say, Oh, I have a pile of this that came from my grandmother or my mother. We really don't have a place. We don't use doilies and embroidered tablecloth. We don't use them the way they used to be used. So um, as long as people know I'm going to cut them up, I'll do my best to, to get them into a museum or something. But I, a lot of work is coming, quilts and embroidery is coming to me from people who just, they know it's treasure, but they don't know what to do with it. You know, it's um, family treasure. Uh, yeah, I, I try to be reverent. I mean, it can be a little shocking to people to see me cutting up or if I teach something and showing the transformation from this tablecloth that's a family heirloom but it's no one's heirloom anymore. No one wants it, you know? So, but to be transferred and turned into the material and turned into something else. I'm, I really want to be reverent with my second use, but I think I either use it or it's just going to rot and be nothing. So I do think about those countless anonymous assistants that I have that do this. I, to accumulate these stitches is just is such a gift, so. Mm -hmm. And I think these pieces make, I think, point towards it in a significant way, you know, this just almost immortalizing that concept within this work, utilizing those secondhand materials, you know, that somebody spent cherished time creating something that might have been really important or might have just been a dish towel that they wanted to embroider and display in their home for beauty, Mm -hmm. But some pieces might have been something like you said, a family heirloom mm -hmm. and, um, you know, seizing that moment of life because you will pass on right. But the way that you reincorporate it and create new stories with somebody else's stories, I think, is a very moving aspect of your work. And it's um, I think it's what makes a lot of people look longer as well in addition to the stories that you're telling with your characters it's that underlying story of the people involved in the making of these pieces as well like what happened yeah how did that happen and but not being able to go too far with that because you're you're confronted with something new and transformative as well right i'm always in, in the collecting part i'm always fascinated I mean, a lot of this is a pattern, like an Aunt Martha's pattern, you know, a kitty cat in a basket, but different people will sew it a different way and with different colors. And I can really feel the person when I'm collecting the thing, you know, some of it's very tight, some of it's quite messy. Um, so there is, there's a little, it's pretty great. I'm on my table right now, it's just piles and piles of embroidery. And um, it's like, I'm, it's like a crowd in here of people because all their work is here. Um, 
So it's it's good. It's good. Mm -hmm. Good work. So here's a, a little bit of her of your influences. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I love um well and compositionally these are very interesting. Good good warning, but also there's some of some of that uh that that print the dance of death one that's dance macabre is one of my favorite images you know of these dancing skeletons you see that across a lot of different cultures so i feel like another these are these other things you know we are squeamish about talking about um sexuality we're squeamish about talking about certain issues of motherhood we're squeamish about talking about death but you kind of it's all happening all the time we might as well get to it and um and talk about it and it's nothing new. Nothing new. It's been talking about it for centuries. In the sense, yeah, in the sense that like we are, we seem to be so afraid of it, but it's just inherent to who we are as humans. It's like really a root part of our human condition right. is dealing with these complex notions that that are part, literally built into our culture, mm -hmm. um, and art being a primary way in which that's expressed because sometimes we don't want to express it but art makes it possible <laughs> and then we can make fun of it yeah a little bit <laughs> yeah definitely um <laughs> definitely like the these little devils turn up and i don't i am i really don't believe in that that image to me is a great excuse to project your own bad behavior, you know, <laughs> the devil made me do a kind of idea is, is a very ridiculous idea to me, but um, it's a great symbol for temptation and struggle and all that sort of thing. And so finding this wonderful boy imagery, I got to, you know, mess around with that little preposterous chubby devil. And I guess this above and below is a pretty good example of just dancing through life and, <laughs> And in and the happiness that sort of ideal day to day and and knowing mortality is there and then these ideas of like a 14th century hell mouth down at the bottom and they're all making the music and maybe she's dancing to that music it's I love those those same thing uh, those kinds of illustrations you see where they show under the earth or under the street I've always loved seeing those and that idea that all these things are happening at the same time and they're sort of oblivious to each other. They are. And that's kind of like, there's a little bit of this whole like potential cause and effect situation mm -hmm. going on, or just the beauty of being oblivious or yeah. completely like unaware of your current actions resulting in something later in the future, but nobody knows. Or it's even kind of being like, like this life of uncertainty, right? Right. Or even being like, oh, well, <laughs> you know, this is, we're all doomed. It is what it is. You'll be bones, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> But anytime there's like blue skies and puffy clouds, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's okay. And I love the hell mouth because um, it's like I said, it's, it's you incorporating that kind of that art historical imagery that ties it back to, you know, illuminated manuscripts and, and architectural features of the medieval period, you know, like <laughs> this whole like real deep concern and deep fear of crevices <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and you know of like you know this giant mouth and what could be there and the end of the world and just this whole um, history of what that means of a time where people knew a lot less than we know now right you know What's but those same ancient those ancient fears continue to perpetuate and and that that mouth is just, <laughs> just still a part of of who we are like ah you know like eating it consuming it fearing it digesting it you know what happens after you do that you know this kind of like what does a mouth do it tastes it fears it's you know what does it say you know <laughs> so it's like this, you know, this beautiful combination of imagery that, um, you know, just has so much information to it and brings a lot of, 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 
an ability to ponder, but also just feel just great joy from the beauty of it, you know? So I just, now that I've said that, I just wanted to show this kind of beautiful side-by-side -side reflection here on these, these images. Yeah, I love those. Um, I mean, again, where, where can I get a model um, to, to do these poses? And it just, I have a ton of these old Dick and Jane type books and I'll go ahead and find some great pose. And, you know, looking at that boy handing the gifts to, um, to the little girl, it's like, well, what else could I put in his hands? That'd be a lot of fun, you know? And it is, it's like a little bit playing with paper dolls when I'm in there, I get to redress them and change, you know, and figure out their, what they're gonna do. Um, but definitely I use these old illustrations as my beginnings of my drawings. They're my models. Uh, those illustrators were really good at, at making evocative poses. So I like this um, comparison because it's, it's like, it shows your influence and in how you utilize these shapes and figures and inform the story that you're telling. But the fact that it's so transformed, right? And it's almost literally poking fun at whatever it came from, like the influence of it. Just, you know, like, you know, I'm a little devil too. <laughs> I'm not really afraid of you. I don't really know what that means. And it's kind of like this idea of like, this little boy is that little devil. But in that scene, he's not. He's like, this is the scene where the boy is seen so you know proper and perfect and you know knows how to open a door and greet his friends welcome to the birthday party my friends you know yeah. I don't think I've ever seen a child do that so no and those bow ties yeah those bow ties I'm not believing that for a second <laughs> but I feel in many ways that 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 little devil kind of is is like just an element that reflects overall on your work, you know, to know what's really there, what's really happening, how can we transform its meaning? Is it all true? Is it not true? No. Yeah. Fun and um, mystery of, of the work. So I am just grateful to have your work here at the museum and um, appreciate um, sharing with you tonight with everybody watching us here on Facebook. So is there anything else you would like to say, Maggie, before we say good night? I, I can't think of anything. The, the work's up through February. So I hope people can get a chance to check it out. And um, where could they find some of your work if they were interested and they're here in Montana coming up? Sure. Um, well, you can see, check out my website if you like, maggiehiltner.com. And um, I, then I'll, they'll, I'll be shown. Well, I have work in a couple of galleries commercially in Red Lodge at Heist and in Billings at Toucan. And then I'll be doing a show in Missoula in next spring at Radius Gallery. So I, hope, I think that's in March. So trying to finish that up, send some things to Missoula. So. And I'm definitely excited to see those shows and um, see the development of these new projects that Maggie is working on. Um, they, they are always an amazing experience. So I invite you all to see her work here and beyond intention. And if you find yourself in those other neighborhoods, please take the time to look at her work and um, support her as an artist and, and all she does. So thank you so much, Maggie. Thank you. Um, I look <laughs> forward to you. seeing you in February. Mm -hmm. So that's when this exhibit closed, February 11th. So come to Great Falls, Montana, to Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art and view Beyond Intention. Um, if you'd like to know more, you can go to www.the-square.org to learn more about um, the exhibit and also follow us on our Facebook feed where our next discussion will be with um, Jennifer Reif Snyder on December 8th, on uh, January 18th at 530, also on a Tuesday. And hopefully we'll have another talk with Ashley Blaylock as well. Um, thank you again, Maggie. And thank you all of the supporters of the square and thank you to our community for, for watching and listening. Remember Maggie has, she can answer your questions. So feel free to make any comment, even if you 
just watched it after the recording and you have questions, I'll be watching and sharing with Maggie as well. So thank you so much. And have a great night. Bye-bye, Maggie.